You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The world can be pretty dangerous, but there are things you can do to help protect yourself. Like listen to the Wired Security Podcast. New episodes are released weekly, keeping you up to date on all things security. You'll hear about new scams and data breaches, secure technologies, and more. Listen to Wired Security wherever you get your podcasts. That's Wired Security wherever you get your podcasts. When it comes to your business, you don't want to miss anything. Luckily, there's Wired Business. This podcast is a great source of information. New episodes come out every weekday detailing top stories, like how AI is impacting various industries or what new social platforms to look out for. Get business savvy. Listen to Wired Business wherever you get your podcasts. That's Wired Business wherever you get your podcasts. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. This is Ken. I'm in the studio with Jeff, Neil, and a special guest. Matt is not here, so I can't insult him. Uh, that's true, but uh, you can he, insult him in his absence. But usually, I, I give him a uh, you know I, I I make fun of his his person. You know what's well, the what's the legal term for when you like try someone in like liable? No, in place of like. Like in absence? It's basically, yeah. I can't remember the mm. word. Well, he's actually at a conference uh, called Sticks in and Stone. In absentia. In absentia. Yeah, we can make fun of Matt in absentia. That sounds a little too cerebral for me. Uh, he's he's at a conference uh, learning about sticks and stones, so that way his bones won't break uh, mm. for taking all the, the abuse we give him. I see. Our special guest in the studio uh, cannot be named yet, uh, but it is not a wizard played by Ray Fiennes. That's all we'll say. <laughs> Voldemort? It's not Voldemort, no. Um, <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> That's not our special guest. Well, that'd be a very interesting episode, though. What would Voldemort be good at, though? What kind of trivia? Probably not that much. Maybe right. just about Harry Potter. No, because they don't, they don't teach anything about magic at that school, so... He'd be a terrible trivia He'd player. Be terrible. Yeah, all right. So if anyone Plus, wants... any questions after 1997, no idea. That's true. And that's what, one of my favorite things about Harry Potter. They always say on the internet, like, wouldn't Harry be obsessed with the Bulls in the mid-90s? But he's not. Right. Um, but I love that Voldemort, yeah, playing trivia, and, and he's terrible. And if anyone in the comments um, defends Voldemort, that he would be a good trivia player, maybe you should, you know, check what house you're in or whatever whatever they're called. Death Eaters, you know what I'm saying. But we do have a special guest here uh, in studio. Uh, we're, uh, we're excited for you to tell everyone uh, what you've been up to because it's a really cool uh, thing you're doing. But uh, we have Bryce Thompson here uh, coming to us uh, from outside of Toronto, Oakland Five Supporter on Patreon. How are you, Bryce? I'm doing great, Neil. How are you? Doing great. So nice to see you in person. You've been on the show a few times uh, hosting, which has always been a really fun time. But you're here playing today. But uh, yeah, tell everyone what kind of uh, pilgrimage you're on. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a little bit about me. My name is Bryce Thompson. I live in a small town called Delhi, Ontario, which is about an hour and a half west of Toronto. Uh, I work as an accountant, and uh, we just finished tax season about two weeks ago, so uh, I've been working 70-hour weeks for the last three months, so this is a nice little break for me uh, about my little trip that I've been on. So uh, the last few days, I've been trying to work towards my quest of hitting every single Major League ballpark and seeing a game, so... I started my trip in Cleveland. I was just in Cincinnati, St. Louis, and uh, got a little pit stop here in Chicago. And uh, I'm happy to be on the show here in person. So that's, that's thank awesome. You. And you you enjoyed Wrigley Field? It was beautiful. I mean, obviously for the history itself, um, great great game, great day for a game. Uh, Cubs did not win. Cubs got one hit today, so maybe not the best effort from the Cubs. Uh, we've maybe been a little bit of a bad luck charm. We've gone 0 for 4 with home teams so far this trip. So maybe they won't let me into the next couple of stadiums if they're trying to win. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Well, as I think we said on the last game that uh, you missed out on the troughs because the troughs are gone. Oh, they are gone. That's right. They're the all, bathroom yeah. troughs. <laughs> you, you are, were you ever familiar with that? Like the long troughs that people would go to the bathroom in? Uh, I've seen them before, but I did not know that yeah. that was a staple there. It was. We actually have some here at the studio, so you'll get a little uh, firsthand hey, experience. We bought them from we the bought... field when they <laughs> tore them out. It, that's why it smells like urine in the studio right now. I was like, can I get a brick from, from the, the wall? No, and I want Ken's the like, nope, we're getting the urinal trough. <laughs> so did they, did they pay you to take those out? Or Turn it into a work? bathtub. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, they basically paid us, because I'm sure you left the game, so even though they lost, but you had a nice twelve dollar beer, I'm sure. So it'll be a couple of twelve dollars. Couple beers. dollars, yeah. Uh, but thank you for joining us. We Two or three it. Budweisers. <laughs> so you and Ken are going to partner today, right? No Cubs, no. Uh, yes, we are. And what's your team name going to be today? Uh, so in honor of uh, Wrigley Field that I was at today, and uh, just a little quiz game we're playing, we're going to go with Quizley Field. All right, and Jeff, uh, you and I are going to partner today and 
since uh, our, our special guest here is from uh, outside of Toronto, the Blue Jays play at uh, Rogers Center. So uh, what do you want our team name to be, Jeff? You don't remember it? Uh, we're going to be Who Framed Rogers Center. I just wanted, to see, I just wanted to see <laughs> if you remember. Knew he wouldn't remember it. <laughs> I was just testing him. I'm sorry. I got to keep him on his toes here. Uh, but yes, we're going to be Who Framed Rogers Center uh, against uh, Quizley Field. But we need a, a host, and we have a very special guest with us who's been on the show a couple times as well herself. Uh, always love having her on the show. Rules Guy Impersonator on Patreon from Southampton, Massachusetts, Lydia D'Agostino. How are you, how are you Lydia? I'm good. I'm good. So yeah, a little about me. Not much has changed since I was last here. Uh, still in Southampton, still working in infectious diseases pharmacy and no exciting trips for me recently, but hopefully someday soon, but very happy to be here. Second time hosting. Yes. Always, always love having you here. Uh, anything special we should expect from your game today? Is it like a special theme or is it a classic triviality game? It's not a special theme. It's everything's pretty random knowledge. Um, I will say the categories are mostly hints and not really categories themselves. We love hints. And uh, <laughs> is there a, a, an infectious disease that uh, you remember studying in school or maybe a, as a professional that um, just the name of it always sticks in your head no matter what, kind of like haunting you a little bit like a, an earworm? Um, probably strongyloides. Strongyloides, okay, because that's what actually our rules read today. Gilbert Gottfried is going to give his best uh, version of the... Um, Personification of strongyloides? <laughs> exactly. So let's see what Gilbert does with that. Triviality Podcast is two rounds of 20 questions worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there's a special swing round by this week's host. In the final round, players wager points they've earned for a chance to become the cream of the crop. Unjustifiably in a position that I'd rather not be in, but the cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. What do you think, Lydia? Uh, spot on. All right, we'll see. It's a professional. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we're, we're ready to play. Um, we got our teams. Uh, so, Lydia, feel free to take it away. All right. So question one in round one, just a pinch. We all speak the same English, right? Since I was born and raised in New England, there are some words I've been surprised to find out aren't used in the rest of the country. Bubbler would be the most well-known example that comes to mind. But what confectionery treat is referred to as Jimmy's in New England, in the UK, or original England, as I like to call it, they're referred to as hundreds and thousands. Cool. All right, we're going to lock in. All right, that was quick Quick from Jeff here. Spent some time in New England? Yeah, he's nodding very affirmatively. About as much time as you. Okay. <laughs> Let me see what you got there, Did Jeff. Did you have some jimmies in Boston? Oh, Let me most, see what you got most there. definitely. Ah, something that I myself don't eat, but I, you were correct. Any idea here, Bryce? Yeah, you know, I'm about to expose myself at how bad I am at playing trivia. This is why I host most of the time. Um <laughs> Oh jeez. I well, I don't know. Uh, con- it's got to be a confectionery treat. Can't be a brand name. It's it's not that guy that you said looks like me that makes chocolate. That's for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Immediately, I went to Slim Jims, but that is nowhere near the correct answer. <laughs> and they meat, they <laughs> meat sticks. Do some of them. <laughs> How about like a like a lollipop? That actually, you know what? Now that you've said that, that actually kind of rings a bell. Okay. So let let's go with that. All right. That's yeah. That's kind of a generic. So I, I agree. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are aisles dedicated to this in Dutch grocery stores, <gasps> and um, sprinkles. We believe it's sprinkles. Yes. Yeah, so sprinkles is correct. Um, according to most sources, Jimmy's is actually only referring to chocolate sprinkles, whereas hundreds and thousands only applies to the rainbow variety. Mm. Um, so just random extra knowledge there. Hmm. And yet sprinkles makes the most sense because you sprinkle them. Is there a sprinkle bay, like a salt bay? I, I think we could we could do that. Maybe we could record a little video. Of just sprinkling. Sprinkling a uh, little sprinkle on little our corn hines. Butter up some toast and just. My favorite application <laughs> of sprinkles is you just roll whatever you're eating in the sprinkles. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, okay. What about yourself? What if you oil yourself up and roll in sprinkles? Maybe that'll be I'll our roll challenge. In some sprinkles. Yeah, yeah, that's our challenge. We're we'll losing pool. That's, that's, that's got to be a Patreon exclusive right there. <laughs> I can't say the you can't be giving that away for mind. free. I think the dye runs a little bit, so it might make a mess, but. <laughs> He'll be nude, so he doesn't <laughs> stay his clothes. Just hose him down later. So question number two. Look closely. 
which fabric pattern became a uniform staple in the early 1900s, later entered into popular fashion in the 1960s, and remains popular to this day? All right, I think we're going to lock in on this one. So it's up to you, boys. Jeff, fabric you... pattern. I'm trying to think of things that are in uniforms. Well, I'm thinking of like flannel and plaid, not really plaid, maybe for like a Scottish uniform, but like, or a kilt, but I, I don't oh, know. I, I mean, it doesn't say like a military uniform. So it could be like school uniforms. School uniforms often have like oh, plaid, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, oh, right, right. I, I, yeah, because I was immediately, I was like, oh, Burberry. I was just thinking of like patterns, but. Uh, but that's not really a pattern. It's just a no. brand. Um, houndstooth, that's a pattern. Argyle, that's a pattern, right? Don't bring up Argyle in front of me. <laughs> I threw up in my mouth a little bit. Is it is it Argyle? Um, what do you think? Herringbone, Argyle, or Houndstooth? I feel like Argyle, right? Okay. All right. We're going to go um, from the twisted mind of Matthew Vaughn, Argyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was on a movie poster. I was like, come on, it's PG-13. Relax. Um, you, had, you had a great idea on this one. Yeah, so obviously I live in a really small town, and uh, one of the only things you can do where I live is, you know, go hunt. So oh. first thing I kind of, well, not the first thing. It took me a little bit, but <laughs> I think the answer we finally landed on here was camouflage. So that's what we're locking mm. in with. Camouflage is correct. Great poll. That's a really, look, really You got to great... look closely because you can't see them. I, I was really focusing on the clue there, and I'm like, what do you have to look closely? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're Dick Cheney, you don't really look closely. No. But... Uh, that was a great question. Fire in the hole. All right. So number three, hurry up and wait. As of January 2024, the countries with the highest and lowest exchange rate against the U.S. dollar are both located in the Middle East and share a maritime border. Name these countries for five points each. All right. Uh, I came up with one. Bryce came up with one. So we're going to lock in here. All right, Neil. So I don't know if you're relying on me for this uh, or what you think, but... Um, I, oh, oh, I just woke up. I blacked out. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost positive that the highest nominal exchange rate against U.S. currency is the Qatari dinar. Okay. So I'm pretty sure it's Qatar. And thinking in the Persian Gulf, the the only thing really across from there is like Iran. Okay. I don't know what their exchange rate is, but that would be my best guess. Yeah, let's go with that. I trust you. All right, we have a totally different set. Uh, we're going with uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. All right, so the answers that I have, which came from Forbes, so if you find something else, definitely let me know. Blame but Forbes. <laughs> the lowest is Iran uh, at 42,300 rials for each American dollar. And the highest is Kuwait, which is a dinar, mm -hmm. but it's the Kuwait dinar, which is one dinar for $3.26. Okay, so no points. Just did you say Iran, Jeff? I said uh, I said Iran. So just five points for us then, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. So Kuwait and Iran are separated by a very small strip of Iraq that you know maybe the U.S. had involvement in. All right. So uh, who framed will be taking five points on that one. All right. On to question four. He must have great eyesight. Scott Thompson, a very polarizing comic, got his start in stand-up in the 1980s and has since appeared as himself on a variety of TV shows such as CSI, Scrubs, and Family Guy. But he may be most recognized for a long run in the Guy and All Those Collect Call commercials. Scott Thompson is better known by what stage name? Yeah, I like... Was he on the middle I, show? I think we both came up with it at yep. the same time, yep. so we're locked in. Okay, so Jeff... You wrote down uh, your favorite comic, Carrot Top. I did not. My um, favorite comic is Pauly Shore. Chairman Thank of the you. board. Uh, <laughs> chairman of the board. So was he on Scrubs? You watched Scrubs. I feel like he did play himself on Scrubs, but... I've seen him on Family Guy before. Talking about someone who must have great eyesight, usually carrots are well known for the... You yeah. Know, yeah for I've seen the movie Shoot eyesight. Him Up. So. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes sense, though. Um, I, I feel like the collect call, I'm trying to remember the commercials. Maybe he just used a lot of props during the commercials. I don't remember seeing these, but... It doesn't like... sound like him. Ken <laughs> loves prop comedy. Uh, but yeah, let's go with Carrot Top. We said... We also said Carrot Top. And the answer is Carrot Top. So I said polarizing, but I think he's actually pretty universally disliked. So sorry if I misled <laughs> you on that one. <laughs> I don't and know if the, it's him or Chris Angel who's more disliked. It's, it's yeah. a, a near near race. I did read when researching this that he also did a bunch of Mind Freak episodes. So both of them in one place. <laughs> it was overlap. 
And it was uh, 1-800-CALL-ATT were the collect call commercials. Okay. Sure, you can watch that on Hulu, but they pull episodes of other shows I like. Does that cancel each other out when you have two bad personalities in the same room like that, or how does that work? No, how does it work in here? Yeah. (laughs) 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 All right. So number five, Gone Fishing. Andy Serkis is well known for his motion capture work on films like Lord of the Rings and the Planet of the Apes reboot, but many other similar roles are still achieved with mostly makeup. With roles ranging from Billy Butcherson in Hocus Pocus to the Pale Man in Pan's Labyrinth, no one does this better than Doug Jones. Despite 185 acting credits to his name, he's never won an acting award. Though they had the same number of spoken lines, his co-lead was nominated for Best Actress for her work on what 2018 Best Picture winner? Yeah, so um, I believe this is where he played the uh, the fish person with oh, uh, um, um, Sally. Help me out here, Sally Seth Hawkins. Hawkins. Yep. You have the at-home appendage that they sold. I know. Yes, that's right. Um, Shape of Water, right? That's, yes. Yeah, yeah, we think that's it's... what the name of the appendage is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah this is the the movie uh, Jeff watches to relax uh, with Michael Shannon. We said the Shape of Water. I watch it with he... Michael Shannon. Yes, he keeps going. Michael Shannon is right. Michael <laughs> Shannon is right. And yes, Shape of Water is correct. Uh, so he actually has been in just about every Guillermo del Toro movie in some capacity. So they seem to collaborate quite a bit. Yeah, um, they, uh, they or he—I should say—he has been in so many good roles and everything, like you said. But he's never really been nominated. But uh, definitely a chameleon for sure. Um, and I always forget that uh, he's in Hocus Pocus. It's a, a, a fun role that he does there. After five questions in the first round, a uh, very close game. Uh, Quizly Field has thirty points, and then the, the uh, Iran uh, answer by Jeff uh, has given us five extra points. We have thirty-five. Okay, so moving on to question six. Seems like torture. The original game of Operation includes 12 removable body parts, which have either punny names or colloquial names for actual body parts or conditions. Which of the removable parts would be more accurately referred to as an effusion? All right. Uh, we, we discussed this a little bit. Um, we're having trouble kind of even remembering what the parts are in Operation, and we've answered questions on it before, but we have a guess, so we're going to lock it in. So I'm thinking of a couple from that game that we played uh quite a few weeks back but we we had to name an animal body part or a couple of animal body parts not too many of them resemble torture but i know when i get a charlie horse i'm like uh that's torture so does that sound like it could be an effusion that that's very possible my my wife is a kinesiologist and she's going to be really mad if i don't get this one right so um I, i think that's probably our best guess here all right let's go with charlie horse well, we remembered that there. I think there's a butterfly in the stomach that you had to pull out. So we were trying to think of something cutesy. And uh, when thinking of torture, um, we were thinking, you know, when you get a, a really bad earworm that, that won't leave your head, like Macarena or something like that. So we just said earworm. Those are both really good guesses. Um, but the actual answer is water on the knee. Oh. Um, so it might have been a bit of a stretch on that clue. It was torture, like waterboarding. Mm, okay. okay. Actually, I thought of that at first. And I was like, what could, could be waterboarding? But yeah. So what is a fusion then? An effusion is an accumulation of fluid anywhere that it doesn't belong. Okay. Okay. So So like when you get your knee drained, basically is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All right. Question seven. It's not scary, baby. What plant's root in the same family as turmeric and cardamom is promulgated for its anti-nausea potential and is a major ingredient in mules? You're locked in. So immediately when I think of uh, stomach being put at ease I, I think of chamomile and well you know what i think of neil i think of ginger uh oh yeah, of course that's also good for your stomach especially for the uh the category here it's not scary baby because we'd want to go ginger spice is that right i believe so and is that in a moscow mule uh it is in a moscow mule so yeah we're gonna lock that in i'm a big fan of ginger how about you i'm a big fan of moscow mules so yeah we're gonna we're gonna lock them with ginger as well Yep, the only actual spice in the Spice Girls, ginger it is. <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. I didn't even think about that. How did you not realize that? I know. I was too busy. Just didn't think about it. Not thinking about it, yeah. Seeing about the girls. Jerry Hallowell. That's right. Yeah. Jeff's favorite, ginger, Harry, Prince Harry. Okay. Question number eight. The plane, the plane. <laughs> Taking it way, way back, allegedly. 
The earliest evidence of what art form was discovered in mummified humans dating back to 3370 to 3100 BC. Oh, <laughs> just got the clue. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, I think that character from Fantasy Island's name is Tattoo. So they probably found some tattoos, some sweet back tats on some mummies. Would you agree with that? I would 100% agree with that. Sweet. Yeah, all the things you said, all the things you said, we, we agree. We said Tattoo. <laughs> and tattoo is correct so i'm glad you got that reference because i think it's too old for all of us um but <laughs> and uh also allegedly is of course referring to the uh alleged back tattoo of mm, neil the way, oh, way yes. back yep <laughs> maybe one day we'll find out the truth what do you bryce what do you think what do you think the truth is i think it's there Lydia, what do you think? I actually am one of the privileged few who knows. Well, you know already. Oh. <laughs> All right, you're sworn <laughs> to secrecy. I will, not, I will not disclose. <laughs> she signed an NDA. All right, next question. All right. Number nine, strong but not always deadly. Though breaking and entering is off the table as invitation-only status remains intact, garlic seems to be a non-issue in which popular 90s tv show that was an early start to a huge 2000s pop culture genre all right we're locked in over here okay so they're locked in we're talking about breaking and entering but the invitation only status remains intact which is vampires to me jeff um i would say so too and then garlic seems to be a non-issue would you let a vampire in would i um i wouldn't mind Depends. being a vampire if it's a sexy vampire Aren't not like a, not like a nasferatu right but like a sexy vampire, maybe? Um, like ready to play some baseball? It's, uh, it's possible. I mean, what if it's Paul Rubens in the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Or not Paul Rubens, David Arquette. I wouldn't let him in. No. No. But if it was a sexy vampire, possibly. Okay. Um, so yeah, Jeff, I'm thinking maybe Buffy. Uh, it's the 90s. Uh, we're going to sue you. And then maybe it inspired pop culture genre. So you have uh, Twilight. Twilight. And the like. You have Vampire Diaries. Other vampires. True blood. True blood. Exactly. Yeah, I like it. Let's go Let's go. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I am. All right. We also said... Yeah, uh, another word for strong is buff, so we uh, went with Buffy the Vampire Slayer as well. Good call. Yep, and that's exactly right. Uh, so watching that show, I was always uh, very confused about why they seem to embrace every other vampire trope, but they never mention garlic. Yeah. Sure. Can't, can't take uh, Mark Metcalf down with garlic. That's right. I'm sure Josh Whedon was like... Check out our old interview uh, back in the day with Mark Metcalf, who played the master on season one, right? That's right. And the maestro. And the maestro. He was the master Seinfeld. and the maestro. Yeah. Uh, but he, never, I, he never has characters with an actual yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did love the... Uh, I do love the original Buffy movie uh, with Christy Swanson. Um, anyway, and Luke Perry. That's just me. All right. Moving on to number 10. You have your mother's eyes. Often used in floral arrangements and perfumes due to its pretty bell-shaped white flowers and sweet scent, what woodland plant, also known as maybells, is actually quite toxic to humans and animals due to the presence of cardiac glycosides. Maybe it's these toxic properties that make it the rarest flower in Animal Crossing, only appearing when you have a perfect or near-perfect village. Great, great idea there, Bryce. So, we're locked in. So... Is this nightshade? I feel like nightshade's toxic. Oh yeah, you have your mother's eyes from Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay, I think. Well, and your mother's eyes—you could have a shade of her eyes. I don't know. Yeah, I like that. Um, nightshade. Uh, yeah, you want? Let's go with that. I believe uh, nightshades are a large variety of plants, like uh, pepper plant, tomato plant, uh, stuff like that. A lot, lot of nightshades out there, but uh, we're just going with. Uh, we said iris because of eyes. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I may have misdirected you on that one as well. It's actually Lily of the Valley. Oh, I was um, going to say so Lily uh, from Secret yeah, Garden. Was, <sighs> you have your mother's eyes was a reference to Lily Potter in Harry oh. Potter. Oh. Um, but yes, these are currently overrunning my garden. And um, I just hope every day that my dog doesn't decide to eat them. So, Jeff, I wrote down Lily too. I'm sorry. With the first round complete, it looks like uh, Quizley Field has 60 points and just a little bit ahead, who framed Rogers Center with 65 points? 
Before we get to the swing round, I just wanted to remind everyone to come join us over at Patreon, uh, at patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast, uh, where you can get uh, a lot of fun perks. If you join for as little as a dollar a month, you can get uh, all of our newest episodes ad-free. But for $5 a month, uh, you can get uh, a lot of bonus audio content, including weekly bonuses on Patreon. Have you been listening to them, Bryce? Absolutely. I listen every week. Awesome. And uh, do you prefer the the weird uh, themed quizzes or crop drop or both? I'd say I probably prefer the weird themed quizzes. The to weird see ones? How, to see how bad I actually am in trivia. You know, <laughs> it's it's a nice litmus test there. And uh, and Lydia, how about you? Do you listen to uh, like the crop drop? I do. I do. I actually really like them both. But like Bryce, I just love more trivia. So I prefer those. Uh, and is there? How, do you have a random crop drop question that we'll we'll mark down for our, our next crop drop and we'll remember off the top of your head? Oh gosh, I don't. Um, favorite nineties one hit wonder. There you go. Very good. All right, we'll write it down. Uh, well, yeah. If you'd like to hear the answer to that question uh, as well as some other trivia, like Bryce talked about, you can go to patreoncom slash podcast and help support the show. All right, Lydia, what do we got for the swing round today? All right. So for today's swing round, it's about bingo. So in bingo slang, and this is U.S. bingo, so if there's a very distinctly Canadian uh, version, I apologize in advance. Um, so we're looking at numbers one through 90. So each number in bingo is assigned a particular phrase. In some cases, they may have more than one. These phrases sometimes describe the number itself, like two dozen for 24 or Valentine's Day for 14. But some of them seem to only be used because they either rhyme or kind of rhyme with the number, and some seem to just be downright random. So I'm going to give you a bingo call as well as a hint, and I want you to tell me the number that call is for. So for an example, I think the bingo call is Winnie the Pooh, or the hint is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. 42. Mm. Precisely. All right. So number one is duck and dive or the number of prime numbers from one to 100 (laughs) number two is christmas cake or gerald ford's presidency number number three gateway to heaven or the club a celeb gains access to when they die too soon number four clean the floor or the number of ben and jerry's ice cream flavors number five queen bee or the age of the oldest woman to give birth, which happened in 2019. Droopy drawers, or a caliber cartridge used most commonly in revolvers. Number seven, turn of the screw, or the two-digit year Chubby Checkers' The Twist and Sam Cooke's Twisting the Night Away were both featured on the Billboard Top 100. Number eight, Tom Mix, or the number of Apollo missions that landed humans on the moon. Number nine, Torque and Devon, or the two-digit year the first Final Fantasy game was released. And number 10, Old Ireland, or the jersey number of John Havlicek, Doc Ellis, and Philip Rivers. All right, we have those bingo calls, and we'll be back to see who gets bingo. Here's a trivia fact for you. Do you know what is on one in five Americans' bucket lists? Learn a new language. If that's you, make 2024 the year you finally check it off the list with Babbel. If you're serious about speaking another language, what Babbel can promise you are useful language skills, along with learning the context, traditions, and culture the language you're learning is grounded in. I like to pretend to be a Dutch boy on the podcast, but with Babbel, I can actually speak to all of our Dutch listeners. And I will say, I had a great time using Babbel before going to France last year. It helped me order food for my wife. Vous avez des options sans gluten, s'il vous plaît? Not too shabby. With Babbel, you can access more than 13,000 hours of learning content. And guess what? Here's a special limited time deal for all of our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash triviality. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash triviality, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash triviality. Rules and restrictions may apply. Are you earning and investing in the stock market? In real estate? How about in relationships? Are you earning and investing in your life? I'm Doc G, semi-retired hospice physician and host of the Earn and Invest podcast, where we have the 201 or next level conversations about money and life. Not only how you make money and grow it, but also how you use your wealth to create a better and more fulfilling existence. Join us every Monday and Thursday wherever you listen to fine podcasts. 
all the numbers have been guessed. Uh, I think we got bingo here, um, but we have to go back to our host, Lydia, to find out. So let's get those questions one more time and we'll give our numbers. All right. So talking bingo slang. Number one, duck and dive or the number of prime numbers from one to 100? It's kind of like a cockney rhyming slang, isn't it, Neil? Mm-hmm. Sounds Absolutely like it. Kind of like it. Uh, we went with 25. We did as well. The answer is 25. Number two, Christmas cake or Gerald Ford's presidency number? Uh, we said 38. Yep, we said 38. And 38 it is. Number three. Gateway to Heaven or the club a celeb gains access to when they die too soon? You said 27. We agree. Yep, the 27 club. Number four, it's clean the floor or the number of Ben & Jerry's ice cream flavors? We were guessing 54. Yep, we thought it maybe could be 64, but we said 54 sounded a little cleaner. It is 54, yes. Good job. Number five, Queen B or the age of the oldest woman to give birth, which happened in 2019. We said 63. For some reason, I initially said 103, but Jeff said definitely <laughs> that's not. That's a lot. So I we, said that's more than 90, Neil. <laughs> so we, we said 63 officially. All right. So you both said 63. Yeah. Is it it's 73? 73. Oh, yeah. Wow. Is that not like crazy? I was baffled and then i went down like a very significant rabbit hole about how that happened but. well i'm a little grateful that we missed that one <laughs> same, same. Uh, okay number six droopy drawers or a caliber cartridge used most commonly in revolvers i'm gonna throw it to bryce for the next five uh yeah we said 44 feel lucky neil 44 magnum the most powerful handgun in the world yeah we said 44 and 44 is right number seven Turn of the screw or the two-digit ear Chubby Checkers the Twist and Sam Cooke's Twisting the Night Away were both featured on the Billboard Top 100. Uh, we said 62. Yeah, I think this might be one of the instances of separation here. Uh, we said 52, which we think might be a little too early. Yes, you're right. It is 62. So number eight, Tom Mix or the number of Apollo missions that landed humans on the moon? Uh, Rep in Toronto, we said the six. And we said six as well. Six is right. And number nine, Torky and Devin, or the two-digit year the first Final Fantasy game was released? Uh, we said Sidney Crosby, 87. And uh, we said um, Travis Kelsey, 87. And 87 is correct, and also my birth year. Number 10, Old Ireland, or the jersey number of John Havlicek, Doc Ellis, and Philip Rivers. And we went with lucky number seven. And uh, we said, uh, what would you get if you added seven children to the number of children uh, Philip Rivers <laughs> all, all already has? Uh, and so we said 17. It is 17. I almost also made a joke about Philip Rivers' kids. Um, that one's actually... There. Yeah, that one's actually a reference to St. Patrick's Day. So Old Ireland, St. Patrick's oh. Day, 17. So the only non-rhyming one. Both teams uh, with 40 points in the swing round. So this game is very even across the board. Uh, it looks like Quizley Field's going to go into the second round with 100 points. And just five points ahead, who framed Roger Center with 105? Okay, so moving on to round two. Number one, no more rhymes, I mean it. Historically worn by aristocrats and still seen as part of certain military uniforms, spatter dashes are perhaps most recognizably worn by what sharply dressed brand mascot? The aristocrats and this, the name of spatter dash almost makes me think of like spattering of awards, you know, that you wear on your chest. I, I don't see, I can think of that as military attire, but I don't think of that as aristocratic attire. I think of like monocles and right. fancy shoes and... Well, just thinking of... Sharply Sometimes dressed. Sometimes I dress like Tony the Tiger with just the bandana and nothing else. <laughs> That's yeah. I was thinking of Tony the Tiger. Yep, with the the bandana. But sharply dressed mascot. I mean, I mean top hats. We got ZZ Top was a sharp dressed man. Oh, I like that because that would be um, Lucky Charms, right? I don't think he rhymes though. But and and the the Monopoly Man also has a top hat. So I guess do you want to go Monopoly Man because we both kind of thought about it earlier. Rich, rich Uncle Pennybags. Yeah, we'll go with that. 
So I think that there's a little hint in this clue saying no more rhymes, I mean it. So I tried to think of things around with mean it, and I came up with peanut. So oh. I think this is Mr. Peanut. Yep, you got it exactly. Wow. It is Mr. Peanut. So no more rhymes, I mean it is a famous quote from The Princess Bride, which is followed by do you want a peanut? Oh, right, right. <laughs> I guess I just happened to stand and saw that answer there. That was not where my head was going, but it works Which, out. Um, really <laughs> nice. It got you there either way. So the splatter so, dash is what? The monocle? No, it's actually on the, the shoe. White shoes? It's like a shoe cap almost. Oh. The whole that goes over the shoe. Yeah, it's quiet, quiet, yes. Oh, I've got him. <laughs> splatter dash. Very very fancy. Oh, very nice. Very Did Mr. Fancy. Peanut die? Uh, I can't believe <laughs> he, he brought him back to when life. He was he resurrected. <laughs> He's back. He was killed and uh, brought back in an he advertising campaign. He was voiced campaign. by uh, RDJ from 2010 to 2013, apparently. Who cares? <laughs> and then Bill Hader for four years. Robert Downey Jr., I believe, for a I while, too. That's why I said RDJ. Oh, RDJ. Okay, you're going by his nickname that you call him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, I've learned so much about Mr. Peanut. <laughs> All right. Question number two. Rocking this hosting job. After being first awarded in 2009... This year's Emmy ceremony gave out the 16th award for outstanding host of a reality or competition TV show. This excludes traditional game shows. Thus far, this award only has six unique winners. The host of the longest running reality show won the first four and the most decorated black artist in Emmy history has won the most recent eight. Which host has the most nominations without a win at seven, all for the same reality series? All right, well, we're not coming up with much on this one. We know uh, we're trying to think of a rock star that might also be a reality host. Um, having some trouble, we know Dave Navarro from, uh, what's he from, Jane's Addiction mm -hmm. and Chili Peppers and stuff, hosted Ink Master for like 20 years or something like that. So we're going to go with him. I don't think he's been nominated, though. Yeah, we, so we think uh, Lydia's question is referencing Jeff Probst uh, for Survivor for the longest-running one and then RuPaul for the, the most recent eight um, we initially had written down a couple other names, but when we saw the clue of Rockin' this hosting job, we thought of uh, New Year's Rockin' Eve. New Year's Rockin' Eve taking mm. over for uh, Dick Clark, which would be Ryan Seacrest. Yep, that's exactly right. It's oh. New Year's Rockin' Eve, Ryan Seacrest. And just um, like so that, all, our lead is gone. <laughs> <laughs> all nominations for American Idol. Um, and actually, I don't know if anyone else knew this, but apparently he's taking over for Pat Sajak. For Wheel of Fortune in I September. I just heard that, yeah. And Simon Cowell will be taking over for Vanna White. <laughs> Could <true>? you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to question number three. No wonder grizzlies hibernate. The highest recorded temp in history is 134 degrees in Death Valley, California, and the lowest temperature is negative 79.8 degrees in Prospect Creek, Alaska. The record for the largest single-day fluctuation in temperature of a range of 103 degrees occurred in the town of Loma in 1972, going from a low of negative 54 to a high of 49. The previous record was a 100-degree drop in the town of Browning in 1916. In what U.S. state would you find both these towns? With We're temps like Oh, oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> with temps <laughs> like these, it's no surprise no pro sports teams play here. So, Bryce, you deal with uh, cold on a pretty regular level, don't you? Yeah, you know, we uh, we take our grizzly or our polar bears to work every day. We all live in igloos, you know, just <laughs> typical Canadian things. Um, oh, geez. No pro sports teams play here. Up in the Great White North. No wonder grizzlies hibernate. Well, um, we're looking for a state with no pro sports team. Um, maybe Montana? They definitely don't. North Dakota, South Dakota, North Dakota. Yeah, yeah. I like North Dakota. I think we can go with that comfortably. Right. You would be one of the few who does. It is the least touristed state in the U.S. Uh, we said Montana. First thing I said. Yeah, he should have stuck with your gut. It is Montana. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Grizzlies is their like state animal, but also uh, the mascot of their university team. Okay, question number four, the lime and the coconut. If you spend a lot of time outdoors, you or your furry friend may have been prescribed doxycycline, an antibiotic which, among other things, 
covers a wide range of rickettsial diseases, including ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. What creepy crawlies bite is the source of these diseases? Yeah, we're locked in now. Hmm. All right. Now that I see the spelling of Lyme uh, with the Y instead of the I, uh, yeah, I agree with your answer, which was tick. Hmm. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, we said Patrick Warburton's the tick. Yep, it is the tick. So probably not super common in the Midwest. I don't know. Do you guys have Lyme disease in Canada? It, we, <laughs> we do. And yeah, it's pretty bad up where we are. Um, all right, we've probably picked a couple ticks off of our dog already this year. Oh, wow. And because we had a very mild, unseasonably mild winter, uh, they just didn't die this winter. So they have <laughs> multiplied like crazy. Oh. So remember, people, just stay inside. Yeah. <laughs> I say we have ticks here, but the, pre- the prevalence of Lyme disease isn't nearly as bad as it is in the Northeast. All right. Question five. Major misfortune. Mother Nature gets angry sometimes, and things like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, landslides, and floods can cause widespread destruction and loss of life. One country seems to have gotten it the worst, with the unfortunate claim of having the top three highest estimated death toll natural disasters all occurring there. This includes two floods and one earthquake. What is this country? We're going to lock in on this one. Neil, as we're looking at it here... Uh, we don't have a strong guess to tie into the clue, but we know Indonesia's had some pretty serious natural disasters, so I think we should lock that in. Okay. All right, and we are going to go with China. And China is the correct answer. So when you have that many people, it's not hard to have the highest death tolls, unfortunately. Um, so misfortune was a reference to fortune cookies. Oh. Um, Just got to so simplify, was... Jeff. <laughs> It takes a simple mind to understand a simple clue. Uh, so that was the 1931 China floods, which I believe was the Yangtze River, the 1887 oh, yeah. Yellow River flood, and the 1976 Tangshan earthquake were the top three. Yeah, those floods were uh, ringing a bell for me. Well, speaking of, uh, of floods, the scores aren't really flooding uh, to either side here in this competition. It's basically the same again. It's going to be 130 for Quisley Field and still five points in the lead. Uh, who framed Roger Center? So not much separation yet. So we'll see if uh, we can uh, bulk up our scores here before the final round, Jeff. All right. So question six, fun in the sun. What traditionally wooden puzzle game with name origin debated to include the Greek word for letter and the Chinese word for to extend was first referred to in 1848 by mathematician Thomas Hill in the book Geometrical Puzzles for the Young? Yeah, I have no idea, Jeff. I think it's that one game where you like move pieces around to maybe complete a picture or something, but I I don't know what it's called. So do you have a name or or no? No, I do not, unfortunately. I say knots and draughts. Okay. We think it's probably that peg game, right? It's like the cracker barrel game, and I just don't know what it's called. But we'll say Mancala, just so we have an answer. Okay. Um, So it is the game that Neil is describing, where you move the shapes around to make like a flower or a swan or something. Um, But they're called tangrams. Mm. Oh, okay. Oh, tangrams. Oh. Apparently, uh, knots and draws or knots and crosses is tic-tac-toe. Hmm. Um, so yeah, the fun in the sun was suntan. That's oh, where damn. I was going yes. with that. Yes. <laughs> All right. So question number seven, no small feet. Public health efforts can include things as basic as indoor plumbing and seat belts to more complicated efforts like the development of antibiotics and vaccines. Though the first vaccine for this disease was developed in 1796, it wasn't until 1980, after years of global immunization efforts, that we finally saw which disease officially eradicated worldwide. We can lock in now. Okay. So um, the description is drawing me towards polio, but I actually don't think it's like officially entirely eradicated worldwide. Um, but it does say small in the in the clue, so you're saying... Smallpox? Yeah, um, but is Yeah. And no. I know they were very early on the the vaccine, although it was a very primitive vaccine. Yeah, I'm just trying to think if it could be something with, like, big in the name, but so that, like, the clue isn't that obvious, but I, I think smallpox is probably 
going to be our best guess there. All right, smallpox. Uh, to the best of uh, Neil's knowledge, there's only one uh, infectious disease which has been successfully eradicated in humans, and that's smallpox. It is smallpox. So polio, which you mentioned, got pretty close, but it's actually surging back due to uh, vaccine hesitancy. So there was actually an outbreak in New York a couple years ago. The, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Bryce is here like, oh, it's just Americans. <laughs> Apparently, we've uh, we've also successfully gotten rid of uh, a disease called uh, Rinderpest in ruminants. Thank goodness. You're a podcast pest. That's the only pest. other we thing a, we've successfully yeah. eradicated. We need a vaccine for you, Jeff. That podcast. one was, I don't, I don't know if that one was from vaccines, but... It was, it is gone. No more render pest. Okay, question number eight. Three cheers for dogs. Prominent in the British royal family going back to 1767, at which time the breed was about five to seven times larger than its modern descendants. What toy breed, consistently among the top 25 most popular in the U.S., did two of the three dogs that survived the sinking of the Titanic belong to? Neil, you are a titan of Titanic... Uh information are you not uh i know some my brother knows a lot more than me um but uh rest in peace uh theoden king this week mm -hmm. yes that's true um, i know a lot about titanic but just that one scene yeah james cameron uh <laughs> famously uh was going to tell him to act bigger and to actually act in his scenes but he said once he saw the dailies he saw that he was doing so much with his eyes that he didn't need to tell him how to act and that's what he got um so the british royal family um, most recently uh, has corgis, Jeff, or at least yes. yeah. Pembroke Welsh corgis. Yes. But it's one of these, I think. Um, oh, we're locked in. You're locked in. Okay, so, so it's one of what? I think it's either Pomeranian or Pekingese uh, when it comes to surviving the Titanic. Okay. Um, and I'm guessing three cheers, meaning uh, what do you call it? Uh, cheerleading uh, pom poms. So maybe Pomeranian. Mm. I like that. Hip hip for that answer, Neil. Okay, we'll go Pomeranian. Huzzah. Huzzah. Well, uh, Bryce is pretty good at picking up on hints, too. So what did we say? Yeah, so that's exactly where my mind went as well. I thought of uh, the pom-poms there, and uh, we went with Pomeranian. So, yep, you're exactly right. Pomeranian is correct. Apparently, they used to be like almost 50 pounds. Yeah. Well, I would take a, like a 50-pound Pomeranian. That'd be, right? that'd be awesome. Imagine the hair. Yeah, right? <laughs> basically a chow <laughs> great uh, great clues in this game all right question number nine not the dolphin still largely regarded as the greatest formula one driver of all time brazilian driver Ayrton senna unfortunately died in an accident at what race in 1994 this race named for the fifth smallest country in the world by area also claimed the life of fellow driver roland ratzenberger I got it. in 2006 the race was dropped to make room for the belgian grand prix all right. Sounds like Bryce knows this one. All right, Jeff, you like racing? I do. Um, and uh, I don't think this is the man's, as they call it. Le Mans? Yes. Le Mans is in France. Um, yeah. Usually an endurance race is held there. Right. Formula One, I don't believe, is raced. They, there is a track next to the like the full Le Mans okay. circuit, and I think Formula One has raced there, but not recently. Now, does does the answer enjoy isotoners, according to a certain movie? <laughs> you know, I don't know now. It might. It might. Ace Ventura, cameoed by Dan Marino, known for his isotoner commercials. Mm -hmm. What do you got with Marino? Yeah, I, I think we're locked in. Okay, what's our answer? San Marino. San Marino. Bryce? Yeah, um, that's... At first, I was thinking Monaco, but I did not hear the entire question. So, um, <laughs> so I was thinking of tiny, small countries that would have likely hosted a F1 race as well. And that's where I went is the uh, tiny little spot off the coast of Italy there, and that's San Marino. Yep, exactly. So not the Dolphin Dan Marino. It's San Marino Grand Prix. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Number 10, best dressed. With 17 to 20 living species, what bird boasts a wide range of pop culture appearances, including as a hallucinated nemesis in a popular 90s comedy and the namesake of a DC Comics villain? So I think the uh, the pop culture appearance is in uh, Billy Madison. 
Yeah. With uh, Chris Farley mm-hmm. as the bus driver. Keep seeing a, a, a penguin, right? Yeah. And of course... Or he have... doesn't see a penguin, though. He sees what? I, 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 uh, Benedict? Huh? Oh, a penguin. Penguin. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, we have a uh, penguin from uh, Batman. So we're going to say penguin. We agree. And you're both correct. It is a penguin. And they're pretty well dressed, too, in their tuxes. They are. They're all tuxes. <laughs> After uh, all of regulation, uh, as we said, the scores are so, so tight here. Uh, the Quizly Field team is going to end with 170 going into the final round and still five points ahead. Who frame Roger Center at 175? But before we get to the final round, uh, just one more reminder about uh, Patreon. You can join us at patreon.com slash triviality podcast. Uh, probably the maybe the best thing about it is if you're listening to this right now, you don't have to listen to this anymore if you go uh, and join us over at Patreon because uh, it's ad-free, even the Patreon drops. So uh, if you'd like not to hear any of this, uh, you know, come and join us, help support the show. We're on our road to 600 in 2024, and we're well on our way, and we can't thank uh, everyone enough for their support. But yeah, join us at patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. All right, Lydia, what are the final round categories? Okay, our final round categories are Uno, Tve, Dry, Kat, and Five. And just in case my accents are terrible, that's one in Spanish, two in Dutch, three in German, four in French, and hopefully you understood five. Um, <laughs> we. <laughs> I will give you the actual categories as well. So okay. Uno is going to be a music question, Tve is a history question. Dry is a movies question. Katra is a potent potables question. And five is a television question. Potent potables. Um, okay. Jeff, you just want to go all in and see what happens? Yeah. Okay. It's been so close all game. And the wagers are now in. So let's go ahead and get those questions. Okay. So for round uno, question or question category uno. The first Spanish language song to chart in the Billboard Top 100 peaked at number 22 in 1959. That same song, this time by a different artist, became the first Spanish language song to chart at number one, nearly 30 years later. This version also performed much better internationally than the original, all likely in thanks to its being featured in a popular biopic that same year. For category today. Generally considered to be the first recorded economic bubble in history, what items skyrocketed in prices during the Dutch Golden Age from 1634 until its collapse in 1637? This item inspired a metaphorical term for asset prices deviating from their intrinsic value and remains associated with the Netherlands to this day. For category three, in Germany, the hand sign for three is made by holding up the thumb index and middle fingers, as opposed to the American version where the three middle fingers are commonly used. In what film do we see a spy give himself away while posing as a German soldier by using the incorrect hand gesture? That spelling counts. It does not. (laughs) (laughs) In category Capre. Despite the name French 75, this cocktail only has four main ingredients. These ingredients are lemon, sugar, champagne, and what other French spirit? And in category five, Woody Harrelson currently holds the record for longest time since first SNL hosting appearance to being inducted in the Five Timers Club at 33 years and 99 days, which he set in 2023. The previous record of 24 years and 75 days was set in 2007 when which actress hosted. This time frame was due in large part to her first appearance being at the tender age of seven. All right, we have our questions, and we'll be back with our answers and find out who will be today's cream of the crop. If you're worried about your safety online, here's one thing that might help. The Wired Security Podcast. There's new episodes every week, and in them, you'll hear about new scams to watch out for, data breaches, tech that can keep you safe, and about tech you may want to avoid. It's an excellent way to make sure you're doing everything you can to keep you and your information safe and protected. Plus, the episodes are usually pretty short, like 10 minutes or less. Because when it comes to your safety, you deserve to know what's going on as soon as possible. Listen to Wired Security today wherever you get your podcasts. That's Wired Security wherever you get your podcasts. Your business is important to you. That's why you're doing everything to help it succeed. 
tracking market trends, diving into research, reading and rereading expert advice. But are you listening to Wired Business? Because you should be. It's a podcast that provides coverage on current and future trends across multiple industries while exploring the latest stories you need to know. With new episodes every weekday, you'll learn about the latest impacts of AI, what new trends to keep an eye on, what big name companies like Amazon or Apple are doing, and more. All in 10 minutes or less. Listen to Wired Business today, wherever you get your podcasts. That's Wired Business, wherever you get your podcasts. We are back, and we have some answers, and uh, we'll find out if it was enough to get that extra five points that we needed. Lydia? All right. So for the question in the category Uno, the first Spanish-language song to chart in the Billboard Top 100, with finally becoming a number one song by a different artist 30 years later, due in large part to its popularity in a biopic that same year. Yeah, uh, this one is a, a really great biopic, at least we think so. Uh, we think it's La Bamba. We said La Bamba as well. And it is La Bamba, the Richie Valens uh, biopic. So Richie Valens being the original artist and Los Lobos being the uh, much more popular version. All right, for a question in the category today. Generally considered to be the first recorded economic bubble in history, what items skyrocketed in prices during the Dutch golden age and inspired a metaphorical term for asset prices deviating from their intrinsic value and remains associated with the Netherlands to this day? Uh, yeah, this one, um, Jeff, uh, usually when he, he likes to walk around at night, uh, the streets alone, he listens to uh, tiptoe through the tulips. So we said tulips. Yeah, I've got all my money invested in tulips. Uh, much like fashion, we all know that the stock market is cyclical. So I think they're coming back around again. Yeah, and um, so I recently was in the Netherlands and also Dutch myself. So I remember hearing at a museum that they used to, I believe, trade tulips like currency back then because mm -hmm. of the skyrocketed value. So we locked in with tulips as well. And tulips is correct, with the metaphorical term being tulip mania or tulip fever. I can just imagine a little Dutch boy going uh, to the red light district in Amsterdam and <laughs> using tulips as currency. Mm. Give me good time. Three tulips, please. Three tulips. <laughs> He's putting those two lips to good use. <laughs> oh, <so> nice. <laughs> <laughs> please tell me where to kiss you, Jeff. Tell me. <laughs> All right, so for a question in the category three, in Germany, the hand sign for three is made by holding up the thumb, index, and middle fingers, as opposed to the American version where we hold up the three middle, middle fingers. In what film do we see a spy give himself away for making this incorrect hand gesture? Uh, we said Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, I think this is where I learned it. Uh, we said Inglorious Bastards. And Inglorious Bastards is the correct answer. All right, We're so for neck. the question, Kakta, despite the name French 75, this cocktail only has four main ingredients, lemon, sugar, champagne, and what other French spirit? So I've made this cocktail. This is in my bar book that I have at home, and I have was racking my brain just trying to think what cocktail or what spirit was this and i know that it changed the color i knew that it was something red or brown or in that area and uh ken threw out grand marnier so um that sounding french enough to me we went with grand marnier and um i believe uh it's this i i know was a um it's not as famously french um coming more from like the northern region but uh i think it's gin so that's what we said so Grand Marnier is very close, um, so I'll leave it up to you guys. Um, the answer is actually cognac, Ooh. and Grand Marnier is like a blend with cognac in it. That's up to you. Yeah, it's up to you since it's it's so tight. So yeah, it's, it's uh, host rules, so whatever you'd like. Oh, okay. Um, I kind of want to accept it just because it, it's almost as much like being a brand of cognac. Like Kleenex and tissue? pretty close it's not exactly like that but all right it's it's, it's host uh host rules we'll so. just put an asterisk next to this one <laughs> yeah, so if we, if we like pull it off can me on on a 
social media if they disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Leave her alone. <laughs> All right. And for our last question, question five. Woody Harrelson currently holds the record for longest time since first SNL hosting appearance, which he broke the previous record that was set in 2007 when which actress hosted uh, this time frame due in large part to her first appearance being at the tender age of seven. Yeah, for this one, uh, we knew as kids that uh, Macaulay Culkin and Drew Barrymore hosted the show and it, it specified actress. So we went with Drew Barrymore. And to take all the drama and excitement out of the final question here, we also said Drew Barrymore. And that is correct. It is Drew Barrymore. Well, after the game, uh, it was very tight the entire game, but uh, it looks like Who Frame Roger Center uh, not getting question four right is going to bring our score to 265, but with a perfect final round and 150 points on top of their previous score, Quizly Field is going to end the game with 320 points, making them today's cream of the crop. Unjustifiably in a position that I'd rather not be in, but the cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. Great game. Brought some, see, you were 0 for 4 with your stadiums, as you said, but you're you're 1, one for 1 here today. So great job, Bryce. Uh, absolutely. I'm bringing absolutely no luck with baseball, but apparently <laughs> the trivia was on my side today. Uh, now, is there anyone you'd like to shout out? I know you have some exciting news, depending if you want to share or not, but anyone you'd like to shout out or, or anything you'd like to say before we let you go today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I'm going to shout out my wife back home in Delhi. Uh, my wife is six months pregnant at time of recording, so we are expecting our first child probably around the time that this episode comes out, a uh, little baby boy, so we're very excited for that. Uh, I'm going to shout out my dad, who's uh, in the hotel room. Uh, <laughs> he's been going on this crazy baseball trip with me, and uh, we've been kind of binging these episodes on our drives city to city so uh, i'd say he's probably your new biggest fan oh cool um, oh, that's very nice and yeah so thank you guys again for having me it was a blast uh thank you lydia for your accepting of grand marnier's cognac and um i, d- yeah. I do see on the internet here uh several recipes uh featuring uh grand marnier being used in a french 75 so there we go there you go well, yeah, thank you so much, I Bryce. I also see gin being included, too. So. <laughs> I, also see, I also see cognac being a variety of let's just, brandy. Let's just, let's just shake hands. Let's just shake hands. Uh, well, yeah, thank you, Bryce, for for being here today. It was so nice to have you in studio and, uh, and great to meet you in person after getting to know you a little bit over the show. Uh, but, yeah, thank you so much. And, Lydia, what a wonderful game. Awesome clues. Uh, really well written, as always. And it's always nice to see you. Anyone you'd like to shout out or anything you'd like to say before we, we let you go today? Um, yeah, so thank you very much for having me. And um, I love listening to you and being here. And thank you, Bryce, for um, playing a great game. Sorry about my controversial cognac question. Um, and I would like to thank the playtesters on Discord, especially Louie and Johnson, um, and my sisters for playtesting with me as well. Oh, amazing. Well, yeah, thank you to all of our playtesters. We love that you're here for us and help each game be as strong as it can be. And uh, speaking of people who help us a lot and uh, who we love to shout out, Ken, uh, what about Airwave Media? Yeah, we love Airwave Media. They're our network. You can find them at airwavemedia.com where they have other great podcasts such as What If World, Sleep Cove, and Abandoned, the All-American Ruins podcast. Wow, uh, that sounds intense. But uh, yeah, check out some of those shows. And uh, we'll love to see you uh, next week on another episode of Triviality. But for Bryce and Ken, Jeff, Lydia, and Matt, who isn't here, my name is Neil, and that was Triviality. Triviality.